mail call, one big package of words and music and laughter delivered to you by the stars from whom you want to hear. In answer to the request you send to Armed Forces Radio, Los Angeles, USA. You know, friends, lots of Hollywood stars become so famous that they're referred to not by their name, but, well, you know, like Frank Sinatra is called The Voice, Marlena Dietrich is known as Legs, Betty Grable is known as The Body. Well, tonight, we bring you the man who is known as the... Uh, Bob Hope! He's an old wolf, isn't he? <laughs> Thank you. How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? This is Bob Mail Call Hope, telling all you servicemen that because of you each day, total victory becomes surer and surer, and if the Japs don't think so, let them watch how the dictators are getting fewer and fewer. <laughs> Well, here we are in Hollywood. You know, the opera season's with us again. I've been spending a lot of time at the opera. Everybody likes to hear good singing. Of course, a lot of people listen to Crosby, too. <laughs> Naturally, everybody who came to the opera was very ritzy. What's swank? Swank. That's French for slink and slunk and mink and skunk. <laughs> One beautiful society girl was there, and she was really covered with furs. She had a sable coat over her shoulders and an eager beaver on each arm. <laughs> Frank Sinatra came to the opera, too. He started walking there wearing a big black opera cape. Suddenly a wind came up, and the next thing he knew, he was a dark cloud over San Diego. <laughs> <laughs> and those opera tickets were really inexpensive. Expensive, I mean. I take it back. I walked up to the window and took out a dollar bill. George Washington took one look at the price and said, I think we better get Abe in on this deal. <laughs> When I finally got to my seat, I had a little trouble. There was a soldier sitting in it, but I wasn't afraid. I said, listen, you get out of my seat. And she was a lieutenant, too. <laughs> it turned out to be a lovely seat, though, right between Rita Hayworth and Ann Sheridan. Every few minutes, they had to turn the cooling system on and turn me off. <laughs> Lana Turner was there. She was wearing a strapless evening gown, so the following night, I went back to see the opera. <laughs> Of course, I hate publicity of any kind, so I tried to remain inconspicuous, but someone noticed me. I don't know why. I was just minding my own business, walking along the balcony railing. <laughs> it was really a great opera, though. It was the first time in history that the soprano ever hit C above high C. She owed it all the years of training, the finest teachers in Europe, and to a kid in the second balcony with a bean shooter. <laughs> And now for some entertainment. Every once in a while, a band comes along that turns the musical world upside down. The guys who are responsible for the latest upheaval are a group of only six hep characters who can really beat it up. Seated at the mail call piano is the leader of this combo. It's Eddie Haywood and the greatest little band in the land.
Thank you very much, Eddie Haywood. And now Mail Call takes a great deal of pride in welcoming its next contributor. He's one of Hollywood's truly great stars, a wonderful guy and a favorite with every single one of you, Clark Gable. Well, welcome to Mail Call, Clark. Thank you, Bob. The pleasure's all mine. Gee, isn't this wonderful? You know, a thing like this happens once in a lifetime. What do you mean? Well, after all, the two handsomest men in Hollywood. Are... <laughs> At the same microphone. You know, now that we're standing right next to each other, I've noticed quite a resemblance between us. A resemblance? Sure, you're pretty tall, and I'm pretty tall. You've got brown eyes, I've got brown eyes. You've got a nice profile, and I can always get my nose fixed. <laughs> Bob, <clears throat> I'm sorry to introduce a serious note here, but uh, there's something I wanted to discuss with you. Well, gee, you really sound serious. Well, I am. Is there any place around here where two men could talk in private? Yeah, but I haven't got a key. <laughs> what is it you want to know, Clark? Well, I'd just like to ask you one question. Yes? How can I become a wolf? <laughs> you, know, you know what I thought you just said I thought that you, Clark Devil May Care Gable Asked me, Bob Who Cares Hope I thought you asked me to teach you to become a wolf That's exactly what I asked you This is the biggest upset in Hollywood Since Crosby got that Oscar <laughs> So you really want me to show you how to become a wolf, huh? That's right I don't know where to begin I've never had this much material to work with before <laughs> But tell me, Clark how did you happen to hear I was so popular with the girls? Well, don't try to act shy. It's all over town. Oh, really? Sure. Everyone says you're the number one ladies' man. Oh, well, please. I'd rather not talk about it. Well, all right. Oh, I'm willing to listen. <laughs> Come on, quit stalling, Bob. Let me in on some of your secrets. How did you ever learn so much about women? Well, I used to be Rosin Boy with Phil Spitalny and his all-girl orchestra. <laughs> I'll be glad to give you any tips I can, Clark. Well, I'd appreciate it, Bob. Well, in the first place, there's a new trend. Women don't go so much for that rough, tough approach now. They don't? No, now they go for the Frank Sinatra type. It used to be love them and leave them. Now it's kiss them and collapse them. <laughs> well, I guess I could become a little gentler. And another thing, you might try being a little more sophisticated. Well, but, Bob, I thought I was sophisticated. Well, I just finished uh, reading three chapters of Forever Amber. <laughs> I started reading that, but gee, no pictures. I... <laughs> Bob, I was looking forward to a little more concrete aid, in the form, perhaps, of, uh, of a telephone number. A telephone number? Sure, you know lots of girls. Well, yes, but I make a practice of never giving away a phone number unless I get one in return. Well, that's fair enough. Here's a phone number right here. You'll like her, too, Bob. She's a big movie star. Oh, swell. Now I'll open my address book. Don't get around much anymore. <laughs> now, now let me see what names I've got here. Say, here's one under the letter L. Lana Turner? No, Lana Crowdfinder, smaller firm. <laughs> but I don't think you like her anyway. Oh, here's one. This is really swell. Is she beautiful? She's lovely, and here's her number. Great. I'll go call her right now. And why uh, don't we get together later? Oh, good idea. I'll get in touch with the girl you gave me, and we'll be seeing you. whose popularity with our troops overseas has flooded the Armed Forces Radio Service with letters each and every week. Here she is, that tuneful G.I. armful giving out with I'm going to see my baby, Connie Haynes. My baby, when he gets home, victory day. I'm gonna see my baby, cause I really miss my baby. I'm gonna kiss my baby, I live and love the U.S. way. Females are right way, you just got something to say. Kiss 
love When he gets home Victory day Gonna get back to the double track See my friends down on me stairs Go by the joint and say hello to the boys Then grab my boy and say let's get lost Cause I'm gonna see my baby Imagine going out with a girl from Clark Gable's address book. Well, this is the, this is the right house here. I wonder what she looks like. Her voice sounded so romantic on the phone. Well, my tie is on straight. Here goes. Oh, hello. I have a date with a girl named May. That's me. <laughs> Dame May Whitty. Oh, Are you the Robert that called on the phone before? Well, yeah, I'm the Robert. <laughs> but you said your last name was Taylor. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> uh, but as a matter of fact, there's quite a resemblance between Robert Taylor and me. Oh, really? Sure, he's pretty tall, I'm pretty tall. He's got brown eyes, I've got brown eyes. He's got a nice profile. And you can always get your nose fixed. <laughs> got a bigger laugh than I did. <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry about this whole mix-up. Oh, that's all right. In fact, I've been most anxious to go out with a man of my own age. <laughs> well, I'll admit I'm not a kid, but as I think that a little maturity is what gives me my charm. As, as Shakespeare once said, how many things by seasoned, seasoned are? What else did he tell you that day? <laughs> I don't remember, but I can check with Crosby. By the way, where did you get my phone number? Oh, from a very good friend of mine, Clark Gable. Clark Gable? I wonder how he has an address book with my name in it. I understand his grandfather left him everything. <laughs> Bob? What's that you're carrying under your arm? Oh, I forgot. I brought these flowers along for my date. Oh, thank you, Bob. Why, they're absolutely beautiful. Paper roses. <laughs> Heavens, these must have cost a fortune. <laughs> no, only five cents. I made them out of the examiner. <laughs> you can smell them and read Dick Tracy at the same time. <laughs> well, I'm just about ready to go. Oh, I just thought of something. What's that? Do you think I'd look more youthful if I went upstairs and put on wedges? <laughs> Aren't you swinging after the ball went by? <laughs> My, you're really dressed up for this occasion. Well, after all, we're going to the theater. Yes, but don't you think you're overdoing it a little? Wearing a coat with tails to the theater? This coat hasn't got tails. Well, there's something hanging down the back. <laughs> yes, when I'm tired, I drag a little. <laughs> but we better move along. We have to meet another couple at the theater. Oh, really? Yes, I gave Clark Gable a phone number, and he's probably picking up his girl right now. Well, this is the address she gave me. I wonder what she looks like. Her voice sounded so romantic on the phone. Well, my tie's on straight. Here goes. Good evening. I'm Clark Gable. Hello. I'm Margaret O'Brien. I can't understand this. Hope told me if I came over here, I'd have a date with a tall, stately, beautiful girl. 
You have them, thank you. <laughs> Don't you remember me, Mr. Gable? I talked to you when you called before. Well, yes, but uh, well, you uh, sounded much older on the phone. I know. I was just using my Laurel Bacall voice. <laughs> If you want anything, just whistle. Well, I'm still a little mixed up about this, Margaret. Uh, how did you ever get acquainted with Bob Hope? Well, you see, when my mother and auntie go out at night, he gets 50 cents an hour for sitting with me. Second, Mr. Gable, I'll go get my coat. Well, now, uh, wait a minute. I'm a little concerned about this date. Uh, maybe we ought to take along a chaperone. Well, all right. But I promise you, you'll be safe. <laughs> you know, Mr. Gable, you haven't said a word about my gown. Oh, I'm sorry, Margaret. It's really beautiful. Do you think it's too daring? <laughs> daring? It's my formal... Strapless rompers. <laughs> Come to think of it, it uh, might be considered pretty risque. Well, I run around with a pretty adult crowd. <laughs> no fooling. I don't want this to get around, but when my boyfriend takes me out riding, he steers with one hand. <laughs> Why, that's dangerous. It certainly is. Yesterday, we almost fell off the scooter. <laughs> Well, we have to meet another couple, so we'd better get started. And I hope you have a good time with me, Margaret. Oh, I know I shall. Do you want to make everything just perfect? Certainly. I'll do anything I can. Anything? Sure. Then for the rest of the evening, would... Would you just call me Scarlet? <laughs> Let's face it, folks, one helping of Eddie Haywood and company is never enough. So here's Eddie again, and this time it's the sunny side of the street. Thank <laughs> you. 
You see, it wasn't such a long walk for you after all, just 40 blocks. <laughs> yes, but at times I had to run pretty fast to keep up with you in that bus. <laughs> well, I kept leaning out of the window to point the way. <laughs> I thought we were supposed to meet another couple in front of the theater. Well, they'll be along in... Oh, here they are now. Hello, Bob. Sorry to be a little late. Oh, that's all right, Dame May. I think you know uh, Clark Gable. Oh, yes. Uh, but Clark, I thought you were supposed to bring a girl with you. Look down here. <laughs> well, there's no use standing out here on the sidewalk. Let's uh, go in the theater. Oh, and Mr. Gable, you forgot to park our scooter. Oh, that's right. <laughs> I'll be back in a minute. <laughs> Gee, that was cute, Margaret. The two of you came down on the scooter, huh? Yes, and I like Mr. Gable. Because he's a strong, silent type. He really is? Oh, yes. He just sat there quietly while I pushed him up the hill. Well, here I am, back again. Oh, well, before we go in the theater, what's playing here, Bob? Oh, gee, I don't know. Well, you picked out the theater. Don't you even know what picture they have? No, of course not. One picture is just as good as another. Oh, then let's go to the theater across the street. We will not. They're not showing the princess and the pirate there. <laughs> Mr. Hope, what's a princess and the pirate about? Well, Margaret, it's a fairy tale. I play the part of the hero, and I marry the princess. Gee, I thought all the fairy tales had a happy ending. <laughs> well, I'll go buy the tickets. You wait right here. Oh, no, you don't have to buy tickets for any picture I'm in. I'll just go to the manager and get some passes. <laughs> oh, there he is. Now, I'll be back in a second. Oh, manager! Well, well, look who's here. Yes, yes, I'd like to go in and see my picture. Again? <laughs> Now, look, I've only... No lunch pail today? <laughs> now, look, you, there's nothing wrong with me coming to see my own picture. 812 times? <laughs> 811, once I sat in the balcony with a girl. Now, do I? Now, do I or don't I get in free? I'm sorry. The theater operator's code says quite clearly in Clause B, excommunicatus contemporad dictorum con moto valedictum fini. What does that mean? We gives no pass to one meatball. <laughs> Part you, and not only for that either. The princess of the part is playing here, and you got pictures of Bing Crosby all over the lobby. Well, he's in the picture too. He only has a small part. I'm the star of that picture. Give me one good reason why you got Crosby's picture all over the lobby. Because we're trying to make some money. <laughs> oh, is that so? Well, well, please, Bob. There's no need to make all this fuss. Come on, I'll buy the tickets. Oh no, you don't. Why should you buy the tickets? But I insist. Nothing doing. Margaret, Margaret, and Dane may have been working steady. <laughs> I wish you fellows would get this settled. Okay, it's settled. I'll pay. Oh, no, I'll pay. No, no, I'll pay. I'll pay. All right, you pay. Who, me? <laughs> oh, goodness, look at the time. What's the matter? It's 7.30. I have to go home now. Well, why do you have to be home so early? I have to get my beauty sleep. You know us actresses. If we're not careful, somebody younger will step right into our shoes. <laughs> Goodbye. Well, that leaves just the three of us. Well, then, the three of us. Oh, my gracious. Isn't this Wednesday night? Well, yes. What about it? Well, every Wednesday night there's a symphony concert at the Philharmonic. A concert? Yes. And tonight I live... You mean? Yes. If no one stops me, I'm dancing with Toscanini. Well, 
There they go. Yep. There's just the two of us now. Got any more numbers? <laughs> nope. You got any more numbers? Nope. Well, what'll we do? What can we do? Let's go up on the balcony and hold hands. <laughs> It was swell having you on mail call, Clark. Before we write for me, is there anything you'd like to add? Yes, Bob. If you let me get serious for a few minutes, I'd like to read you something a very great man wrote. I loved the infantry, he said, because they were the underdogs. They were the mud, rain, frost, and wind boys. And in the end, they were the guys without whom the battle could not have been won. I remember sitting in the darkness of an invasion barge, even the dizziest of us knew that before long, many of us stood an excellent chance of being in this world no more. I don't believe any of us was afraid of the physical part of dying. That isn't the way it is. The emotion is rather one of almost desperate reluctance to give up the future. That includes so many things. Things like seeing the old lady again, going to college, of holding your kid on your knee, of again becoming champion salesman of your territory. And yes, even of just sitting in the sun once more on the south side of a house in New Mexico. I never heard anybody say anything patriotic, the way the storybooks have people talking. I think it was just the application of plain, unspoken, even unrecognized patriotism. Clark, I knew the man who wrote those words. You're right, he was a great man. One of America's greatest, Bob. His name was Ernie Pyle. That's it, fellas. The end of another mail call letter. Signatures include Bob Hope, Mark Gable, Dame Maywitty, Margaret O'Brien, Connie Haynes, Eddie Haywood and his orchestra, Frank Nelson, the Armed Forces Radio Service Orchestra, and yours truly, Don Wilson. This program is arranged with the cooperation of the Hollywood Victory Committee. Another mail call will be coming your way the next time you hear... This is the Armed Forces Radio Service.